On Deji360, we don't just ask the questions. What is wrong with amending the constitution the way uh, the, the National Assembly members have been doing it? We seek answers. The constitution is constituent. Our problem is not um, lack of laws. Our problem is lack of the willpower to implement our laws. Answers that provide clarity. While we negotiate, we should try to make it a point that the girls must be complete. The clarity you need to make informed judgment so that you can make the right decision and take action. People are saying it is you politicians that are responsible for this, that you are the reason why oh, this is happening. All these dollars that call themselves governors in this country? I wish we had people like Tony at the National Assembly. God forbid that I go to join that uh, family. DG 360, providing clarity to issues. All right, let's turn our attention now to uh, anti-corruption. President Mohamed Buhari has declared a national emergency on corruption. The president made the declaration when he signed an executive order seeking to restrain owners of assets under probe from carrying out further transactions on such properties. He said there is a very strong link between corruption, peace, and security. In his speech at the signing ceremony, President Buhari said he chose to sign the order so as to stop owners of the assets from using their proceeds to pervert justice. Let's take a lesson to more of what he said. It has thus become necessary to rekit and retool our arsenal to be able to effectively tackle corruptions perilous counter-attack against the Nigerian state. Accordingly, the federal government of Nigeria has declared a national emergency to deal with the crisis. In this regard, the federal government of Nigeria, in line with its anti-corruption strategy, seeks to ensure that the end of justice is not defeated or compromised by persons involved in a case or complaint of corruption. It is in consequence of this that I have decided to issue the executive order number six of 2018 to inter alia restrict dealings in suspicious assets subject to investigation or inquiry bordering on corruption in order to preserve such assets from dissipation and to deprive alleged criminals of the proceeds of their illicit activities. This can therefore be employed to allure, forward, or intimidate the investigative and judicial processes of or acts of terrorism, financing of terrorism, kidnapping, sponsorship of ethnic or religious violence, economic sabotage, and cases of economic and financial crimes, including acts contributing to the economic adversity of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and against the overall interest of justice and the welfare of the Nigerian state. Happily, the fight against corruption is gaining some more, more, more momentum among the African states. We just returned from the African Anti-Corruption Year event at Mauritania, where all African heads of state were gathered to promote the anti-corruption message. Nigeria and 39 other African states have ratified the African Union Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption. I pledge to elevate, to, uh, to elevate the African Union anti-corruption agenda at the next session of the United Nations General Assembly in September this year. Therefore, in order to preserve Nigeria's political and economic systems and the continuous progress of the Nigerian state from the serious threat of corruption, I call on all stakeholders and indeed every Nigerian to give effect to this executive order. Now, the signing of this bill is expected to strengthen an anti-corruption war the president has fought so far to maintain in his three years in power. But how much of an effect will it have 
on the judiciary in the prosecution of cases and not just cases now, but especially corruption cases. And I've been joined on the program by Larry Suraj, who is the president of the Network of Civil Society Against Corruption. Larry, thank you very much for coming on the program. Um, how important is this Executive Order 6? Um, it is very important um, to the extent that um, this is within the constitutional power of the president to issue such uh, an order. Uh, that is one, because we need to understand before people start uh, also raising issue about the legality of the legality, social and the power of that. It should be the National um, Assembly. Precisely. That. Um, that's a presidential order. And that is number one. Number two, it is also very important uh, because there are quite of other legitimate legal provisions of the laws empowering some of the anti-corruption agencies uh, to the extent that they can actually exercise this power. Yes, I, I, and I was going to say that because right. b before now we yeah. know um, some of these anti-corruption agencies now like the EFCC, mm -hmm. It would appear the mm. EFCC especially has been exercising this power. We've Precisely. seen the EFCC mm. confiscate assets, mm. you know, place um, assets mm. now, prevent mm. people from doing transactions. Some suspe of those are exactly. suspicious so, assets. So what difference does it make? No, so that, that is number one. So, I mean, I've just made the second one. So the third one is to the extent that there's a process of crime bill that has been before the National, National Assembly, Assembly, you know, uh, for more than two years now and it's not been signed. Um, Kudos to quite a number of some of the individual parliamentarians who have been working with the civil society to push this to a certain level. But it, you can tell that it is not a priority, especially to the leadership of the National Assembly and some of the other members who are seeing this as um, a potential target for them because of their past and because of their present situation. So they wouldn't want to be caught with the potency of that bill. So they've kind of either stalled the progress of the bill. So this presidential order is coming now to address some of the lacunas that are existing within the law. Uh, part okay. of the thing is to the extent that even though the EFCC Act also empowered the, uh, the EFCC to uh, freeze some of those assets, uh, suspend the utilization of some of those assets, and attach those assets to a court uh, application for interim forfeiture and possibly final forfeiture, for pending the um, conviction of the suspects that are affected with the uh, crime under which those assets are attached, is also the management of those assets that are forfeited uh, to the government. I mean, really, there's basically no law for now that assist some of the anti-corruption agencies, agencies to deal with those assets once they are forfeited to the federal government. So, and, and, and this executive order takes care of that? Yeah, so it has given now the attorney general to also make additional provisions in, in terms of the, uh, when you look at the order, to make an additional extension of provisions under the order so that some of those provisions can come under the executive order to assist with some of these anti-corruption agencies to deal with those assets. So how, how does this, in totality now, how, how does it improve, if you, if you like, the, the fight against corruption? Now, now, so this is actually a very potent weapon for um, this media and the civil society okay. to also go ahead and sensitize the people that, I mean, this is the GRA in Nikeja, for instance. You see assets and properties springing, springing up, up on a daily basis. Daily basis. Uh, and you Everywhere. can't even know who is the owner. Even when you see the owner or you know the owner, you can't trace the sources of wealth that are used for building this. So we can actually, on the basis of every of these assets, send... All of them are listed there in the order. The, uh, you don't even need to wait for EFCC oh, really? or the police or the ICPC. So the civil defense is there. The customs are, uh, is there. Uh, the standard organization of Nigeria is there. So you can approach any one of them under this um, present order and say these are suspicious assets that you think are connected with coal. You have not in any way laid any allegation, but it is so, so Are you saying if you suspect, for instance, and, and you approach any of these agencies, they are duty-bound to investigate? As a matter of fact, not only are they duty-bound, they are under this law if they fail to do what is expected and you take it up with the office of the Attorney General under the president, they, are, they, are, they can under this order, be prosecuted and also dealt with accordingly. So it is not only that they are duty-bound, they also have that obligation 
and they can on the strength of your petition if they fail to act as is expected under the order and that is why the order is also so wide. So all the laws that are connected with corruption, with trafficking, with terrorism and drug kidnapping, yeah, America. kidnapping are all part of the crime. So if the owner is not a public officer that is corrupt but is involved with terrorism act or supporting terrorism, kidnapping, they are bound under this law to act using any of the existing law that uh, prohibits um, such activities. It's quite, quite wide-ranging, and a, a, a problem is that a lot of people don't know, and I, I think, as you have said, civil mm. society like yours should mm. be uh, educating people more mm. on this. Now, uh, uh, does this mean we might begin to see a plethora of cases come up now, for, especially from civil society group now, groups now like, like yours, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. we'll begin to see you probably make reports or lay reports mm -hmm. before some of these agencies. Yeah, yeah, inevitably. Uh, even citizens um, can also go into class actions without even waiting for civil society to do it. Individual can do it them on themselves. And the anti-corruption, this is one of the things that we can still give to this government in terms of the fight against corruption and even in terms of the promises, uh, the cardinal promises of the government to Nigeria. There's no doubt in the fact that the frontier of anti-corruption, uh, accountability and transparency is actually being broadened by some of the moves, uh, the policies and programs of the government. The whistleblower policy, I'm kind of also not so happy with uh, the um, the level at which citizens are embracing the whistleblower policy. I mean, this is also with where you have reward uh, for people yeah, to also people get... Are basically doing it just to exactly. get Exactly. So uh, people are not embracing it enough. So with this one, it is obvious that the fight against corruption is not a government thing. It is not a thing for the political elite. These are the people who are affected, now, even by the uh, allegations, and they are not as, uh, the okay. ones that would uh, actually change the system. The citizens must take ownership of accountability, transparency, and good governance in the system. And because you talked about uh, the issue of ownership now, uh, you know, some people have, have observed, and to some extent you would say, well, they seem to have a point, that it, it appears this whole anti-corruption thing mm -hmm. is just built around the president. Mm -hmm. You know, people will tell you, look, we can vouch for the president's mm -hmm. integrity. We can say confidently mm -hmm. that this president is not corrupt. So mm -hmm. when you have a situation where it's the president that this whole thing is built around mm -hmm. and then the people, the people themselves do mm -hmm. not believe in it. So, so, so what, what happens when the president, after the president leaves office? Don't mm -hmm. you have that fear as an anti-corruption mm -hmm. crusader now mm -hmm. that all of this might just collapse after this president leaves office? It's actually a major fear. It, it's a serious concern, not even only to civil society, to even the international community. And if you see um, also what uh, I think the president of Mauritania said recently, that you know, if uh, Africa is to be like a country and there's a need to have a president, they'll probably have President Buhari to be the president for Africa. I mean, these are things that are resonating not only locally, but also at the international level. But people are not also seeing that percolating, not even only to um, just officials of the government, even at the state level, state level, even at the local government level. It's still almost like business as, as usual. usual. And you would want to understand the amount and the level of separation of power um, and also the whole principle of um, federalism that we operate. Uh, there's a measure to the level of m certain independence that are enjoyed by the states where the federal cannot just um, wake up and say, uh, unlike when you have with the uh, President Obasanjo, when he actually seized the, uh, the funds of legal state for creating local government, mm -hmm. and that was actually reversed by the court. So it's still a bit of a challenge, but how this can be mitigated to a large extent is for people to actually take ownership of the process. Uh, like I said, the ruling class and the political elite would never change the system. They are the beneficiaries of the rot that we have. They are also responsible for taking the country to where we are now. So it is only Nigerians themselves that can actually say no, enough of all this. Uh, but the challenge usually is the fact that quite a number of also citizens on the road, there are uh, potential aspirants to some of the yeah, exactly. opportunities to also go and go, go, do the exactly. same. Uh, and uh, others are beneficiaries of the rot. So, I mean, when this government came into office and you will see 
oh, we don't seem to have money for this again. So even an ordinary bricklayer who is not directly affected by some of the policies or issues will say, ah, okay, it's becoming, things are becoming hard. And when you ask, how directly have you been involved with someone, no explanation. But it is... It can be understood from the point, point yes, that I've had people free say, money, let yeah. corruption come back. Come, like because that. there were free money. So people who steal money in Abuja would come back here and he would just splash money around and say, build this property for me. He doesn't care if you're stealing the materials. He doesn't care if you're also stealing the money because he's also getting quite enough of it. They do the same thing in the villages. They patronize all the political... Um, associate and the rest of So in the absence of that, there won't be any money again. So where the money is not freely flowing like before, then the man who is expecting that looter from Abuja or what, that uh, brief grace con contractor coming from Abuja to share loot is not doing that again. So it, it becomes a major problem where people would say, if corruption will return, let it be. And funny, and funny enough, this happens everywhere. I mean, we, yeah. we see it in churches, we yeah. see it in mosques, oh, precisely. where they are not... You know, these mm. political contractors, if you like, are no, no longer making the kind of contributions. No, I mean, if they you look at the revelations with some of those that are being prosecuted, you will see quite a number of them who were under the so called responsibilities um, in, in court were either responsible for taking people to Jerusalem for prayers for the government, those who took them also to Saudi Arabia. For the ones who are also consultant for religious affairs and prayers, and people who also pay very huge tithes to to churches and also some to to the mosques. So, if that is not happening again, you, you can be sure that the pastors and the imams are not going to be comfortable uh, with, with the current with the situation. Current situation. Lanris Raj, thank you very much for coming on the program. But very quickly, before I let you go, one issue I just need to take you, take, take, uh, take you up on. The, the issue of what, what do you make of the judgment, um, the, the Supreme Court judgment now on the, the president of the Senate? Um, I, unfortunately, I think it's a major setback for the fight against corruption. I think it is also very unfortunate uh, that the Supreme Court has... Um, inadvertently uh, dampened also almost the moral of many of the anti-corruption agencies. There's no doubt in the fact that in the public opinion, uh, there are evidences to show that the current Senate president, even coming from uh, um, Kwara State, uh, called people of some of those allegations. And that is what the Court of Appeal has evidently shown, but I would want to wait for the full judgment from the Supreme Court to understand what exactly uh, are the basis for this final decision where you would want to say that the, um, uh, the uh, current Senate president. Look at what came up with the Panama Papers. You saw his names and assets and the rest of that. Look at assets also in the UK under the um, unexplained wealth order. Some of the assets that are traceable to him. So you can ask yourself, what is the salary of this person as a governor, governor. for the eight years? And mind you, under the law, is not allowed to engage in any other private uh, venture or business except farming. So we need to have seen the farm of the Senate president to justify some of the monies that are shown, evidentially, that are shown moving from banks to private accounts to jewelers and all the rest of that. Well, the, the, the judges of the Supreme Court say everything was just here, see? No, it's so unfortunate. Thank you very much for coming. It's always my pleasure. Well, we'll take a short break and we'll be right back.